Hello, my name is Paul Robinson. I'm going to talk today very briefly about uh, why the circadian T3 method or CT3M should be in the toolkit of all doctors who have patients, thyroid patients, with partial adrenal insufficiency. I'm going to start by looking at some graphs that show thyroid hormone over 24 hours and that show cortisol over 24 hours as they form basically the, the, the basis of the method. The, the first set of graphs comes directly out of a piece of medical research. Um, let me show you the graphs and I'll explain where it comes from. Here we go. I hope you can see these and I'll explain them in a minute so don't worry too much to start with. Um, this comes out of a piece of recent medical research um, uh, the title of which is Free Triidothyronine has a distinct circadian rhythm that is delayed but parallels thyrotropin levels. Um, uh, thyrotropin being uh, TSH. Uh, it's by Russell and Harrison et al. And it was done within the last few years. There are three graphs here. Each graph has time along the bottom, uh, starting at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning and going through to um, midday and then rising to... Um, midnight here and then nine o'clock in the morning over here. Each graph uh, has that basically along the x-axis. The first graph shows TSH over 24 hours. The second one shows FT4 over 24 hours and the third one shows FT3 over 24 hours. Now there are two lines, sets of lines in each of these. The dotted line which you can probably barely see um, is the mean level of each of these hormones over 24 hours and the solid line is um, the same data but with group cosina superimposed. Um, it doesn't really matter which one you look at because the patterns are pretty clear in both cases and um, it's probably easier to, to look at the, the solid line. Now if we look at TSH here, what we see is that at the beginning of the day, we have TSH here, it, lo it lowers um, to around midday and then begins to rise during the evening and eventually peaks around between midnight and the middle of the night here that's about three o'clock in the morning midnight here um, and then starts to drop again so TSH in fact we know very well from the data on TSH that TSH pulses are very high during the night and they're much closer together than during the daytime second curve is FT4 um, this is much more flat um, although it does tend to rise a little in the daytime and then in the night it tends to fall a little. I'll come back to that in a moment. The really interesting one here for me is FT3 which um, which falls during the day and then, then begins to rise again so this is a point around midnight and then the middle of the night it rises. There's a lot of T3 being produced here. Now one of the really interesting things about this is that um, at the point that FT3 is very, very high, at the peak of the day, FT4 is, if anything, slightly lower. Now, the researchers that did this study said that they believed the, the FT3 rise was due to thyroid production of T3 during the night in response to the rise in TSH. Um, I'm not entirely convinced about that. And we know from other research that... Um, uh, that TSH is um, geared to um, T4 to T3 conversion. The higher the TSH, the more conversion we get from FT4 to FT3, and the lower the TSH, the less conversion. What we see here is very high TSH, and what we see here is very high FT3 in the middle of the night, around about 3 or 4 o'clock in the night and a slight drop in FT4. Now if this was due to thyroid production of T3 in response to a rise in TSH, I'd expect FT4 to rise as well. That's not what happens. So I disagree with some of the researchers. I actually think conversion is a factor here. But to be honest, in terms of this um, presentation, it doesn't really matter. The most important thing is that FT3 rises. So that's the data on, that's the data on thyroid hormone. Let me just look briefly now at the data on cortisol over 24 hours. I'll hold this chart up, but this is much simpler. You'd be glad to know. Here we go. Okay, 
So this is a 24 hour profile of cortisol. The peak here is when someone gets up in the morning. It, it rises from the early hours of the morning. It peaks when somebody gets up and you can see here um, around about um, midnight the levels are quite low and then gradually during the early hours of the morning it peaks. This rise here, this rise here rather, is pretty much in line with the rise of FT3 um, that we saw on the previous chart. Now, I am not implying by that that there is a uh, a, a linkage between um, FT3 and cortisol such that when FT3 rises the adrenals get more stimulation. I'm not implying that at all. However, we know that cortisol is the highest volume steroid in the body. And we know the adrenals are working extraordinarily hard during that, those early hours of the morning. It is no surprise at all that the body would want to ensure that there was a very, very healthy supply of free T3 during that period when the adrenals are working extraordinarily hard. Now I had this idea about, probably about 16 years ago, uh, when I was still ill. I was on T3, I had improved on T3, but I was not well. I still had adrenal issues, and I'd been looking at the curve of cortisol. That graph on thyroid hormone was not available, the research had not been done. However, I knew I was taking my T3 in the daytime, and I knew that it would be low. During the, during the night, during the lowest point. And I, I thought to myself, well, if the adrenals are working extraordinarily hard, wouldn't they require a decent level of FT3? So I experimented and lo and behold, it worked for me. I got well um, and uh, the circadian T3 method was created then. I never knew it was applicable to a wide range of people uh, until, until the book was released, Recovering with T3 was released. Now, since then, we know that th hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and possibly thousands of thyroid patients have used the circadian T3 method and found good success with treating adrenal issues. We also know that in many cases it is far more effective than hydrocortisone or adrenal glandulars. And the reason for this, I believe, is that for many people, their issue is low FT3, low 3T3 levels, 3T3 levels when the adrenal glands are working hard doesn't apply to everyone, it's not, the, it's not the same issue for everyone, some people have other issues for sure, but it, this is one, one cause of partial adrenal insufficiency and it appears to be quite a large cause. Now I also believe that in a healthy person, these curves that I've shown you, um, in terms of this curve here, again, this, these are all in healthy people, healthy people with working thyroid glands, I should have said that earlier. It's pretty, it's pretty obvious that that's the case, but they're work, healthy people with working thyroid glands. Now, in thyroid patients, thyroid patients take daytime medication. Typically, they take T4 or um, natural desiccated thyroid or T3, and they take it in the daytime. These result in high levels of thyroid hormone in the daytime. They don't result in high levels of FT3 in the nighttime. It's a different, it's a different model. And it is no surprise at all to me to find that there's almost an epidemic level of adrenal issues in thyroid patients. And I think that's largely due to the way in which thyroid medication is taken. And I think for some people, uh, they have a lot of margins in their bodies and they can take daytime medication and they never have a problem. For some people, they don't have as much margin. I didn't. I know a lot of people that didn't. And the circadian T3 method helps them enormously. Um, and that is pretty much the circadian T3 method in a nutshell. I, I introduced it in the Recovering with T3 book. And this is the new revised version, which is out now. And I've written further about it in the new CT3M handbook, with a forward by Dr. Sarah Myhill, um, which, will, which is released at the end of September. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. I hope that explains it very simply. This is explained further in the in the in the CT3M handbook. Um, it's a very simple concept, and it fits well with how the hormones actually work. I am hoping that over time, doctors understand that this is one way that they can actually treat partial adrenal insufficiency, and it works. We've seen it work a lot of times with thyroid patients, many, many, many times. It doesn't work every time. And often there are other issues involved. 
but it's a great tool to have in the toolkit. Thank you.